<clears throat> good morning, good morning, good morning. How are you? Oh, I've been blocked in. There we go. I'll give you a tip. When you park, if you can see the wheels of the car in front, then you've always got enough space to get out. That was a tip I got from a guy who was a professional driver. And uh, it's useful if you're chauffeuring someone where you may need to take evasive action. You're never blocked in in traffic. If you can see the wheels of the car in front, then if the car's attacked, you can always get out of the queue. Don't know why I remember that. Don't know it's likely to attack me other than the uh, oh, uh, funny <coughs> I probably think of quite a long list of people <laughs> there you come to think of it yeah mm, mm, join the queue but um, anyway how are you all right another sunny day in paradise 4th of July greetings to our American cousins I was once uh, Asked by the a German why the why the British don't celebrate the Fourth of July. So it's a shame uh, to have to work indoors, isn't it, in weather like this? But in fact, it's it's a weird thing. But the evenings seem lighter, even though they are now getting shorter. They seem lighter now because we've got uh, cloudless skies. It seemed until sort of uh, the third week in June, the weather was like low overcast, white cloud. So you didn't want to go out in the evenings, and now, now you do want to go out in the evenings, and the evenings are drawing in. But we've got a, a phenomenal amount of daylight now. Uh, it's light till about 10 o'clock, and it's light again at 4 o'clock in the morning. This, which aggravates me a bit because I'm a big fan of double summer time. I honestly think that uh, we should put the clocks forward two hours in the summer and one hour in the winter because in the summer, in the winter it wouldn't make any difference at all but in the summer it would take an hour of daylight from about four o'clock in the morning when we're all asleep and add it on the day till you know to, so it'll be light until 11 o'clock in the evening when we're all having barbecues and just generally outside so. and we have we have a fantastic weather in this country thanks to the jet stream and the uh, Atlantic uh, the warm water that's brought across the Atlantic and so we are unseasonably warm in this I mean we really are a, a, it's a freak the weather in this country is freakish compared to how north we are how how uh, what our uh, latitude is and we should be like snowbound most of the year and uh, have howling winds for the other half but we have this lovely weather thanks to this global weather anomaly which we're in the center of um, but it does mean that we have far less daylight than you would normally associate with weather like this so we have um, we don't have like the snow of Moscow, but we have the daylight of Moscow, and we have the weather of uh, uh, a much of more southerly latitude, but we don't have the daylight of the more southerly latitude. So, which is why we're all borderline vitamin D deficient in this country. That and the fact that we all have to, we're forced to work indoors, sitting in front of a PC first person that can uh, invent a computer screen that emits natural sunlight that would stimulate our vitamin D would be uh, would make a lot of money <clears throat> because we're all we're all we need to take vitamin D tablets in fact if you've got a prototype of such a machine I suggest you send it to Julian Assange because he's the guy who needs it the most at the moment so anyway, thanks very much uh, to those of you who replied yesterday about the, the Barbara post. It seems that uh, 
we all have patients who are want something for nothing, you know. It's only natural to want a ten pound note for a fiver. I think the you know, I mean that's natural, that's what it's homo economicus, isn't it? It's everybody acting in their selfish best interest. We're looking for value to give as little away and as get as much as possible back. But it only really uh, becomes a problem when you realise that you are offering or have started to offer value and in excess of uh, the value that you're receiving in return and you then try to change that situation. So if you have been giving away £10 notes for a fiver then and you try to change that, you know, start trying to charge £10 for your £10 notes, then you get a tremendous amount of pushback from people who believe that they're entitled to this uh, value exchange and uh, and blame you for, uh, you know, uh, ruining a good thing for them. Uh, and no, and no uh, you know, and you're like, well, can't you see this is a bad deal from my point of view? And the answer is they don't care whether what, what the deal is from your point of view. The point is that they've found a place that gives them free stuff and they want it they'll be disappointed when that place stops giving them free stuff and of course this applies in the surgery where you're um, you know most commonly on the National Health Service when you go private and what the patient sees is they see it as essentially the same service only for a greatly inflated price so a service that you should be providing for £50, you're now charging £150 for the same service. So they, that's a loss, you know, I mean, they see that's a... And fear of loss is a very powerful driving force in terms of people's ac economic activity. Your um, many, many goods are sold with an implied fear of loss. So, for example... Um, a sale is a fear of loss because uh, you're, what you're doing is you're saying you know you can buy this thing now at uh, 20 30 40 percent off but then the sale will end and then you will lose your right to purchase this thing at a discounted price uh, or uh, a discount which I suppose is a sort of a sale but um, incidentally the discount that you need to offer to get anybody to take any real uh, action to get people sufficiently motivated to take up your offer is 17%. Don't ask me why, <clears throat> it just is. So, but if you're offering 5, 10, 15% off, people will look at that and go sort of, oh yeah, well that's interesting. But once you exceed 17%, once you start to get to the 20, 25, 30% off, then people will then seriously start considering making a purchasing decision because that is a significant discount and a significant loss if they don't take uh, take it up. So, <clears throat> but it's, I mean, we've never really done discounted dentistry. I find it difficult to think how you could. Our, all of our pricing is based on the fact that it's fair to both parties, you know, to the patient, to us and to the lab. And we charge £540 for our crowns and if we put put some sort of significant discount on those, suppose we discounted them by 20%, which would be £108 off 540 it would be £432. First of all, who's the market? You know, the market is people who you've told need crowns but didn't have them done and the subset of that people who didn't have them done on the grounds simply have cost so you know are they going to are they going to then say okay I'm going to overcome my worry about the cost because I, I can save a hundred pounds on this crown how do they think you're going to save the hundred pounds it's not like a software sale where if you're, if you've got a flight simulator and all the planes go on the 30% off, because you know that the way that they're going to create those planes is they're just going to duplicate them, they can clone them, 
they've got very very low cost of production most of their cost is research and development and intellectual property and the actual cost of manufacture is, is negligible more or less in the total sum of things so to get them at 30% off you, you don't wouldn't have to worry about quality and things like that it's just an opportunity to buy you know they, they just want to stimulate sales and they, they have a sort of um, with a plane for example when a plane is new they will charge a premium for it so you could pay $70 for a plane complicated one and then they will come down to the more usual 39 or more likely $29 and then you might pick one up that's 30% um, off and the reason why is that the, you know this graph of the sales where you have the early adopters and then the bulk of people who are going to buy it buy it and then eventually your sales tail off to the point where you're making nothing on them anyway so you can you may as well sell another say a thousand at two dollars than have no income at all at uh, 29 the thing's not going to sell anymore and, and crowns are not like that are they at all I mean the bulk of our uh, efforts are in the physical work you know the actual physical creation of the crown the manufacture of it if you like is not the cost is not negligible at all and there's a very real laboratory cost to be paid etc etc so anyway so there's not much potential for discount in the industry I've had a thing through reminding me to uh, book early for dental showcase dental showcase this year is going to be completely different and probably completely the same it's completely different behind the scenes because the British Dental Trade Association latterly renamed the British Dental Industries Association for no reason that I can make out uh, decided to sell the show and they sold it to a publisher and the publisher is going to want to make their money back, their millions, three million or whatever they spent on it. And so there's, there's a complete break really with the traditions of the BDTA in terms of... Um, BDTA was, was quite inclusive, you know, I mean it was originally it was a, a trade uh, it was an attempt to try and set up, I'm not going to call it a monopoly because they, they didn't really, I mean who knows, you know, who knows? Who was it who said that you don't, two businessmen never sit down without some talk of fixing the prices? <laughs> and it's quite true that we do pay over the odds for every as a profession because they think we're a wealthy profession. There is, I can't believe that there isn't some element of collusion over fees. Uh, the Office of Fair Trading and the Monopolies and Mergers Commission never, never examined dental suppliers, which they should do. I mean, really, they, their trousers would fall off if they saw <clears throat> what the situation was in, in terms of ownership of dental suppliers. But, uh, the uh, BDTA sort of said to the associations that we want to have associations there because we want to be seen to be inclusive but they knew that most associations could cannot afford to exhibit at the BDTA because they're not making any money it's not cost effective as an association therefore it's not a good use of your budget to exhibit at an exhibition and the reason is that most people don't join you know they don't walk along what you'll do is you might think to yourself well I, I fancy upgrading my digital x-ray I'll go to the exhibition for uh, and have a look and see have a prod of a few and have a chat to a few you know sellers and see uh, if they're doing any special offers well, even better you know um, but exhibitions are all about goods they're not about services nobody really sells a service at an exhibition um, I've got the radio on that's better, a bit of peace and quiet. Nobody sort of just wanders past the GDPA or the DPA or the DFO stand and, and thinks, oh, do you know what? I think I'll join an association. <laughs> or 
all of our recruitment is done basically <clears throat> through word of mouth and online so and it's very expensive to you know let's assuming that you don't pay anything for the uh, stand so you get the you get the space free which in itself is you know like several thousand pounds worth of value and then uh, let's say that um, you're going to have to take a minimum of two staff because they're open like long hours one person can't do those hours and they get upset if you're not on the stand they wander around and they just see your stand empty with nobody on it then they get upset so they do ask that you try and keep one person on the stand at all times you know pee breaks exceptionally and then you've got to put those two staff up in hotels and it sort of starts on a Wednesday you have to uh, get ready for the Thursday so you, you're overnight Wednesday Thursday and Friday so that's three hotel rooms per member of staff so that's six hotels so and they're not going to get much you know unless you go like Airbnb you're not going to get much less than 100 150 quid so that's no that's a thousand pounds on hotels and then you've got to feed them so you've got you know meals three days worth of meals etc and then probably go out for a meal either on your own or with, with a group of others or whatever and so you're looking at a bill of I don't know let's say conservatively three thousand pounds when you include travel and uh, then you've got to add on the cost of jollying up the stand with some three pop-ups are going to cost you a few hundred quid and then everyone's going to want <clears throat> free pens or and you've got to remember to take along vacuum cleaners and uh, pens and application forms and membership lists so that when people come up you can and ask you whether they're, when their memberships going to expire so you can tell them so all in all it's a big deal but the the new owners have sort of circumvented all of that by abolishing the free association stand space so really that's uh, that's the end of that you know uh, kudos to the BDTA and the BDIA after them for giving away the free stand space but if you go to uh, oh, it's a little hedgehog if you go to um, if you go to the BDTA this year, which we won't be going, because uh, I don't think, I mean, I might be going as a delegate, there might be people laugh just to take the staff up there uh, for a day, just a day out, you know, <clears throat> but um, we won't we won't have a stand there, and I don't know how many other, the other associations will, we'll see. But anyway, if you want to contact us, I mean, the association's stands are the Probably not the best place to talk to us. Soon. Just give us, send us an email, give us a ring. So, what else? I've got really. Uh, I mean, I don't know. I mean, obviously, issues arise every day with the patients, which are sort of quite interesting and the general principles and things like that. The one we've got at the moment is this big problem over prescribing temazepam. Last time I prescribed temazepam, you just gave someone a private prescription and then they took it down the local pharmacist and they dispensed the tablets. Now it turns out to, to prescribe any controlled drugs you need a license. And this um, license is 21 pages long and uh, I still haven't got around to filling it in because uh, we had one patient who needed it and Tamazepam is much better than Valium which is what everyone's taking. Valium takes 24 to 72 hours to clear out of your system. Tamazepam's out of your system in a couple of hours. So it's a much better drug but um, I know I've mentioned this before so but I'm, done, I'm still in two minds as to whether or not I want to <clears throat> fill in this form. <laughs> to be honest, you know, it's cheaper to go on Alpha Bay 
and just bloody buy some of the things. I could probably buy a hundred to Maze Pam on Alpha Bay for 0 0.001 of a Bitcoin. And you know, and get off a reputable supplier, someone that's made thousands of sales that has got like a five-star rating. So don't start talking to me about clones and you know and milk powder and all that so I'm talking like you know just buying to Pam in the same way as every other country in the world you can walk into walk into a pharmacist and say I am a dentist you don't even have to say you're a dentist in India I went my wife had a um, food poisoning and I found the local pharmacy and I walked in and I said I want some uh, uh, well she wanted some anti-diarrhea tablets obviously at the time but I said to them, you know, I need some, my wife's allergic to penicillin, so I said, I want some erythromycin, uh, stearate, 250, 500 milligram caps, uh, tablets, and they're like, oh, you could have them, you know, but they just didn't have them in stock because they're not the sort of thing that uh, people want. People always want uh, penicillin, they want amoxicillin and stuff like that. And that, they didn't give that to me because I was a dentist. They gave it to me just because I was a customer, you know? You could just, I just walk, anyone could walk in. I was at the end of a long line of people queuing up for antibiotics. So, <clears throat> but no, over here, to prescribe four tablets worth about 30p, I've got to waste about a thousand pounds worth of my time. There's no use writing to your local MP. My local MP is Craig McKinley. By the time you see this, he could probably be in jail, for all I know. Right, okay, sorry it wasn't too interesting today, but, you know, it can't be earth shattering every day. Just a normal day, isn't it? Just another day in paradise. All right, talk to you tomorrow. Bye.